So can I now, I think it's apt for a panel on terror, tra trauma and survival uh, to start that session. The panel is shared by Helen Nichols of National Secular Society. Can we welcome uh, Helen and, and the panel uh, members? Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm Helen Nichols of the National Secular Society from the United Kingdom, and we're very honoured to be sponsoring this event. Um, I'd like to thank Nazmia for this very powerful film that we've just watched, and we'll start the panel. So I think Nazmia um, needs very little introduction. She's a prominent actress in the Netherlands and co-founder of the Zena Foundation, a theatre initiative that travels through different neighbourhoods in the Netherlands using local stories for performances. And the rest of the panel, we have um, Mimsy Vids, who is an ex-Muslim YouTuber who discusses issues that Muslims and non-Muslims face. She's part of the movement to normalise ex-Muslims, to put an end to blasphemy and apostate scrutiny in Muslim communities and to raise awareness of these problems. She's also in the um, Council of Ex-Muslims film, Women e Leaving Islam, which I have seen and would recommend. And then we have Savin Bapir Tardi, who is a chartered counseling psychologist. She conducted her doctoral research into how traumatic ex events are experienced. For eight years, she worked as a counseling psychologist at the Iranian and Kurdish women's rights organization providing psychological therapy to women who have experienced honour-based violence, forced marriage, domestic violence, and female genital mutilation. Then we have Victoria Guggenheim, who is a, an award-winning body artist, producer, human rights activist, and photographer, and public speaker. Her art ranges from body painting, makeup, photography, sculpture, performances, installations, digital art, clothing design, and drawing and painting, and she's very interested in using science and technology in art. And she's also been the Council of Ex-Muslims resident artist for the last 10 years. And then last but not least, we have Milad Resem Manesh, who is the chair of the uh, um, Ex-Muslims of Scandinavia, and he also hosts a weekly TV program for his organization. So um, the first question and um, list is, what are the consequences of renouncing religion? We saw here a family who are wh where the consequences are being faced to some extent by the whole family. And also, how does uh, renouncing religion af adversely affect non-believers? Nazmir, would you like to go first? <laughs> I was just... Um, how does it affect? People? Yeah. How does it especially affect non believers? Uh, I don't. So, yeah. We saw a bit of that in your film. So, what, what were the repercussions? What happened after? Uh, I don't get uh, the, the question, so obviously. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think actually the film, um, you know, obviously depicted. Uh, how the, your family responded to you kind of questioning or even just saying things about, about Islam um, and criticizing. I do want to say though, um, it's, your family were, I would say in a minority, I don't know if <laughs> other ex-Muslims would agree with me, but um, you know, my background is I went to school, a Muslim school in London. Uh, I was surrounded by Muslims constantly and that reaction is quite unusual. Um, the normal reaction is you can't talk about it, you can't criticize it. Um, and, uh, you know, the way that Muslim 
the real religion is anyway is it's sort of you're either in or you're out you know you're either a muslim <laughs> and you follow it and it, there's no flexibility in the religion it's sort of um one way or the highway and the highway is eternal torture um so sorry i'm out of breath because i'm pregnant not because <laughs> just <Can I? laughs> congratulations yeah, no, yeah. No. <laughs> Now I'm up to speed. Okay, cool. Thank you Carry for uh, helping me um, with your gorgeous, gorgeous <laughs> belly. Uh, yeah, I was a bit shocked because I'm, I'm like, we. I think we all know how it feels, and and I think we have valuable time. And I'm so excited to speak about um, how to overcome this uh, big sacrifice. You have to uh, the cost of leaving. Uh, the clan leaving, uh, you know, even if it's only energetically or in the mind, the family being shunned, being, you know, uh, almost forced to give up your birthright, which is uh, your, your, um, you know, your, your place in the family and in the community, which is, uh, it's not only a thinking exercise, it's on all levels for a human being such a profound, it's literally dying without dying, you know, because we are, we are animals and our, our biology says, you know, we want to be safe, we want to in the be in the group. So I'm not interested actually in, uh, you know, what it is, because I think we all know, I'm interested in searching for and wanting to reach out to people and say, it is not either or. It doesn't have to be. You can, t you know, muster up the courage uh, and refuse to 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 give up your place. Um, always be safe first, of course. But uh, and and um, yeah, go up to your parents or to your family and remind them who you are. You know, there is a loving a love bond at first. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly add to that. Sorry, I'll stop talking. But um, <laughs> I um, I don't know how easy that is. I mean, it's 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 something that's really really difficult and something that, um, you know, <sighs> going up to your parents and saying this is kind of what I want to be for some reason in these Muslim communities. And as I said, I kind of grew up around. Doesn't matter what culture they came from, the Islamic communities are very, very similar in their mindset. That it's, um, you know, a conditional love that you have with your family. There's an expectation of you. Um, you know, it's sort of, you're my child, but you don't have your own identity. You don't have a choice in the matter. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you'll agree. So, you know, and so, <laughs> Even just saying it, it takes so such bravery, and it's really not something that's quite easy. And for for some people, yes, maybe it can be a discussion, and it can be sort of an argument, and then it sort of can be resolved. I would say that's definitely a minority. Um, majority of the time, you 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 can't be part of this family. I mean, you know, I was cut off from so many members of my family immediately as soon as I said, actually, I think I'm an atheist. Um, that was it, you know, there's no, well, there was a little bit of bargaining, like, are you sure you don't want to go to hell? Um, <laughs> uh, that sort of thing. But then it's, we can't be family, as you said, you know, you, you don't have a right, your birthplace, you don't have that anymore, though. Um, and I think it's, it's not always easy to fight for that. And obviously, in so many countries that, um, you know, Muslim countries around the world, there is a death penalty and um, so much more. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to someone else now. <laughs> okay, I think Milad wanted to say something. Yeah, I think to answer the question, it's like, it's really important where you live in. If you live in a secular society, then uh, basically you have to prove yourself among your family, friends, and the people around. But if you live in a country like Iran, which the official law is the Sharia law, and you cannot basically renounce religion, you cannot survive if you do so. So if you, like, as a child, as a teenager, would like to have a secular life, your parents get worrying. I mean, you have to answer this question. How are you going to survive in this society? How can you cope with the government? 
I do remember, for example, like, you know, I was, I don't know, 13, 14, and I was just like discovering like this big range of metal music in Iran, in Iran. And I was living in Mashhad, which was like a very religious place. Uh, my mom was kind of worried about me because like, you know, the week before that, there was like a propaganda documentary by the government say like, all these people listening to rock or metal, they believe in Satan, they gonna like, you know, they did really bad people to kill each other. And my mom was worried like, if you really listen to this stuff, if you're gonna have piercing, if you're gonna wear like black t-shirt and stuff, how can you survive in that society? So think about yourself, think about your future, think about the consequences you may face by the regime. So for me, inside the country, and I think there was, it's true with many other teenagers living in Islam-stricken countries, how can you survive the government, not necessarily family and friends? How can you live in that society? Would you like to stay and fight for it, get arrested? getting flogged, being in prison, tortured, or you want to leave the country? That's the main question, rather than how you like, deal with your family and friends, I think. In Iran. I, okay, seven. I just want to add a point that before we move on, how do you tell your family that you're a non-believer? There is a whole other process that goes on before that. What Mitzi was saying about this conditional love and conditional acceptance, it's not just about not feeling loved. It takes something very important away from the individual, and that is the sense of autonomy and a way to think critically for yourself. I run the support groups, uh, and uh, a common pattern that we see is there is a whole process where the individual starts thinking, is it really true what the Quran says? Um, and they start questioning, but they cannot discuss this with the family. Often these conversations are shut down. And this is what, relig what makes religion so appealing. It's very rigid. There is a right and there is a wrong. And we all have a common understanding of what that is. And uh, often in those communities, and um, there is no conversation, there is no critical thinking, uh, obviously not in any way, any criticism of the Quran. So they cannot engage with that conversation within the family, and often they look for information outside. And uh, a critical age when individual makes the decision and has the strength to come out is usually when they are at university, where they think critical thinking is actually okay and it's encouraged. And Victoria, do you have anything to say? So, um, yeah, there's a bunch of things I want to say, and I also want to expand upon the theme of terror, trauma, and survival. So, um, obviously, I've um, been working with the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain for the last decade. And um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Richard Dawkins, because you're the reason I'm an activist. So from, yeah, so from your work, um, I found out about Mariam, and then I found out about the plight of ex-Muslims, and I thought that the, it was so unconscionable, I had to do something, and that's the whole reason I'm here, so thank you. Um, so, yeah, so from, from um, my perspective, I've seen what um, what shunning does to people, how there's so much trauma um, when you have to, um, you know, you leave something that's, uh, you know, your entire foundation that's been shaken. Um, from my perspective, like, I don't think I was made to believe. I was um, brought up in a, a demi-religious way, um, and I went to kind of a Church of England school, which was kind of, you know, religion light. But there was also things like, you know, you're guilty by default. If you're female, you're especially guilty by default. Um, and... I, I do remember there were conversations where, you know, it's absolutely de facto that God exists. And um, I just, I constantly felt like an interloper my entire life. I'm like, I'm not meant to be here and be having these conversations. You're asking me what God looks like. And I've, I've never believed. Um, and so I, um, yeah, I have no contact with people I uh, went to school with. I have no contact with, um, with people from um, my religious past. Um, because I just I just didn't believe. Um, and in terms of uh, processing that trauma, um, I think art is incredibly important. Um, and I've noticed that, especially with um, you know, especially with terrorist groups, there's always the stifling of art, like in the um, case of Charlie Hebdo. And um, when you stifle art, you stifle the human spirit. 
And um, that's one of the biggest things they want to do. They want to crush your human spirit. And it's very important if you're, if you're going through trauma, if you're experimenting, if you're exploring. I think one of the best things you can do alongside um, you know, critical thinking is your own um, interpersonal and artistic exploration because that will give you such a massive sense of autonomy, autonomy alongside you know, the questioning that you're doing. And it can really help with the therapeutic process. Um, and in terms of uh, leaving orthodoxies, I, I do have to expand on Jimmy's point uh, yesterday. So, um, yeah, so basically, um, I would argue that there's kind of a new orthodoxy happening, which is uh, gender ideology, and I've had kind of first-hand experience of that, um, where I would say I have left um, a church because I have had gender dysphoria since I was around four years old. Um, and recently, I... Um, I was trans by someone, they thought that I was meant to be a guy, that I was meant to be on testosterone, and when I lost that identity, so I was living as a guy for a year, and uh, when I lost that identity, um, and I was questioning things, and I was questioning processes within um, gender ideology, I lost probably most of my so-called LGBT friends. And this is when I was questioning things like, why are there dead rats being nailed to the door of Vancouver Rape Relief? Um, why are there um, women being hung in like, in, like effigies of women being hung and people are saying kill turfs and the, the one thing that upset me the most was um, I saw a report of a mural a, a piece of art, a mural for stillborn children which their mothers were mourning that had been defaced because the organisation was quote unquote a bit turfy and that absolutely, I, I cried for about two hours afterwards. Um, so I think in terms of um, you know, terror, trauma and survival, wherever orthodoxy is, you absolutely have to challenge it, wherever it is safe, wherever it's acceptable. Like, and even if it's not quite, like, if you can be brave, you have to come out, you have to speak out. And also use art as your process, use art as a way of you know, um, maneuvering your survival, making sure you're having a dialogue with yourself, make sure you're thinking critically, make sure you're thinking rationally, and ally yourself with people who do actually understand your struggle, regardless if it's an unpopular one, because it's not about being popular it's about being it's about being on the side the right side of history it's about being you know em empirically right in a in the most um, the purest most moral way with no grandstanding no orthodoxy it's about what is um, you know what's decent and what's humane thank you okay thanks Victoria we might come back to the role of art later but I'm just going to stick first to the program questions then we'll carry move on so just back to the questions of ex-Muslims as how do ex-Muslims cope and survive and I can't take credit for the next poetic question how can I walk away when my legs are not my own which I think sums up the, the role of the individual within the family and the the tension between the two oh, would anyone like to come in on that how do ex-Muslims cope and survive <laughs> um, yeah, how do they cope? Um, it's, it's a process, I'd say. You know, it's something that you have to... It's a very deep wound, I think. You know, I've worked with a lot of ex-Muslims after, um, you know, being abandoned by their family. Some of them want to be killed by their family um, and they're sort of hiding out. Um, all sorts of situations I've, I've, I've kind of been dealing with. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that takes time because it's there are so many things that they're even unaware of you know the amount of women I've spoken to that have you know body issues because they're so used to having this idea that actually they're supposed to be covering up um they're not allowed to be seen and if they are seen then they're a slut essentially um you know there's just an, a range of issues that um you're having to kind of work with um, and initially, I'd say the, the first kind of step, I don't know if Savin agrees, but it's, you know, just kind of the separation and the loss of identity and the loss of the family is the kind of grieving process that you have to deal with that because, you know, um, we kind of all touched on it as well, like, you're, you're losing a part of yourself and your family who you grow up thinking, you know, this is this is how it's supposed to be, this is my mum, this is my dad, we, you know, there's love there, and, um, you know, and, it, you know, I think, um, I think you put it really well, actually, Nuri, um, you said, um, sorry, <laughs> Nesmith, <laughs> you said um, that, you know, you're kind of dead 
but you're alive. I think that's a really powerful way of describing it because you're, you become invisible. You know, you don't you don't know who you are. And, um, so there's yeah, there's so many things to work on. Do you want to just? I I do want to really, and I do agree on that issue of identity. Um, it takes many years for an individual once leaving the family to actually build their own authentic identity. Because when you're living uh, within a family that you expect it to behave in a certain way, you have a false identity. You're one person at home, you're another when you're outside, and you're a different person when you are within your own thoughts. So it takes a very long time to rebuild an authentic uh, identity. Um, but there are also two different kinds of coping that we do need to think about. There is the internal coping, so the internal rebuilding of the sense of identity, but external ways of coping. And I think that touches on Mila's earlier point about the society that we're living in and what kind of support is available. Uh, some ex-Muslims that I worked with found it very difficult in seeking mental health health support within the mainstream mental health services because there is a lack of understanding of the issues that they faced and sometimes they feel that they have to educate the therapist on what it is that they have gone through and um, other times therapists feel um, uh, ambivalent about asking certain questions because they feel that they might offend the individual. Um, one thing that we have great acceptance of uh, in the UK is diversity. We accept that, but we don't accept diversity of thinking and diversity of thoughts. And uh, that really echoes within our professionals as well. We don't give um, sufficient training to mental health professionals in how to deal with issues that are outside um, the mainstream issues that we might see as mental health. Because the pain the individual faces when being shunned from the community and from their family is not in their mind. The fears are real. The dangers are real. Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, for instance, uh, to go back on that, is um, it has been literally... Um, um, not only bit by bit filling myself again with myself, but also uh, conquering terrain that when you walk uh, in the streets of the city I was studying and then you see um, Turkish men who don't even know you stare at you like, who are you, whose daughter are you, you know, who do you belong to, to, to be able to internally, you know, stand right up and be like, I am my own woman, and that even was such a big battle. But I think also what is the most important, um, um, there is one thing that um, I have been subjected to, which I think a lot of people have here, which was real and utter and complete violence of, you know, uh, uh, you know, disregarding of, of who I am, you know, my essence. And, um, and I have really, really experienced that as uh, such a deep violation. So much so that with my kids, my kids later on had to tell me, mom, you can be more, um, you know, here for us because uh, we don't find that violent or something we like you you know to be with us and middle uh, you know mingle with us um, and say some things about us but what I mean by that is a way of imposing thinking is I think so violent I, I see that as violence that's why for instance I never say about myself I am an ex-Muslim because I want to be very clear. I don't want to belong to no party, no group, no one. I am my own. And the exact description of who I am is, when I was 16 and I was standing in my um, bedroom and I had this epiphany thinking of Allah and all the things I heard and I realized, this can't be God. If there is a God, it should be bigger than this. Then I realized I don't believe. But up until then, I didn't believe. It was the first time I was questioning religion. So I am not X, 
Huh? And um, yeah, I want to make it very clear, you know, uh, and also I want to make it clear that for me it is very important to um, to be authentic and exercise thinking, real free thinking, which is so hard to do. You have to be so clear for that. And, um, and not, uh, you know, uh, not, not uh, um, be as violent as, uh, as my family, but in the name of free thinking. Okay, Milad, I think you want to say something? Well, I think it's, again, really depends on how normal it is in a society that you live in to have a secular family member, to have like ex-Muslim or homosexual in your, in your family. The thing is like, um, I, I just like talking to, when I was like an English student, I am just talking to my classmates, mostly females, coming from mainly Saudi Arabia, Dubai, these sort of countries. They're saying like, it's really tough for you as a girl. Go to your dad and say like, I don't believe in Allah anymore. I'm, I'm an ex-Muslim and I would like to live freely in a secular like you know, method and stuff. But you can ask your parents still to help you financially to go abroad for study. So if you can just like, you know, have an application, for example, studying in the UK, you can study and you can have your own identity. You can be an ex-Muslim in a free country. So I think it's very important that like we normalize it among the major, like, you know, Muslim societies that it's very normal to have a member of your family that not necessarily follow the Islamic rules, that not necessarily like believe in like, you know, Islamic traditions and have different lifestyle being secular and stuff therefore i think we need to have more progress and we need to have more organization like ex-muslim we need to have more ex-muslim to be out of closet and be loud and clear and talk about it so hopefully we can just have said like normalize it among the muslim people among the like the families don't be scared she can still be your kid she can still be your family member she still can be recognized by the family by the friends despite the fact she's an ex-muslim or she or he homosexuals so i think it's really important how to normalize it normalization is very important thank you Victoria, did you have anything to say on this one? Yeah, I just wanted to um, basically just offer a uh, supportive role, if you like. Um, so um, I do uh, body painting projects uh, for um, ex-Muslims and free thinkers, and I've obviously worked with um, CMB for so long. Um, and I am starting a new um, body paint project on the um, journey of people who go from um, being Muslim to ex-Muslim, people who are uh, free thinking and challenging those beliefs. So um, a lot of people who have um, engaged this way has found it um, really therapeutic. Um, and obviously um, I've used uh, body painting for um, protest and to push free thought. Um, so if there um, is anyone here who um, is an ex-Muslim who wants to be painted for that particular project and wants to be supported, um, I'd really love to hear from you. Okay, the next question is about how ex-Muslim pave their path back to the family, if, if, if and when that's possible. Um, got a line again, isn't my place within my family my right? Well, that's a difficult question, because legally your family don't have to talk to you, but morally, obviously, family is a huge part of society. And does anyone want to come in on that topic first, about how do you pave your way back to the family, if indeed you can? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I think actually what, what you were saying, I think just normalizing it and thinking of the bigger picture is, is, is helpful in this situation because it's not always going to be a situation where you can unfortunately go back and uh, for a lot of people it won't ever be the same again. Um, but I think, you know, if you can do it safely, I think it's important to... Um, to, you know, even if you have to move away and live away, which I know a lot of people have done, um, I think it's still important to keep doing and, and eventually, hopefully, you know, things will start to become normalised and I, I know, as I said, I know a lot of Muslim communities are very much on... Um, 
uh, sort of how they're viewed as well. It's very much about how other communities, or sorry, how people in their community are viewing them, right? It's all about perception as well. You, I think someone said something like, oh, th this person's thinking about your father and they know your family. And it's, it's very much kind of interconnected in that way. Um, but if there's so many families that have children that are ex-Muslims, um, you know, the hope is that it happens so often that, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I don't know if I'm being super hopeful, but this is the hope, right? <laughs> that it happens so often that, you know, it does become just part of our society too, as it did for Christians. Um, yeah, just a moment. I think honor and shame plays such a key role that prevents this reunion within the family. And it's really unfortunate because uh, honor and shame are both emotions. And we know human emotions are irrational. And yet, we allow them to take over. Uh, it does happen where uh, a member can start communicating with the family again. But as Mitzi said, it's not the same again. And it could be one or two members of the family. But it doesn't mean that the whole community and every single member of the family then accepts them back. Unfortunately, that path in uh, rebuilding a relationship with a family is a very complex one and is unique and different for each individual. So there is not a, a kind of a generic answer whether that does happen or what is the way that it happened. Yeah, I must say I am, um, I am so, so aware of the uniqueness of my mother's being, you know. And, and I also understand that I'm very lucky to be born in a Turkish family uh, because when I look at Pakistani families or Moroccan families in Holland, they are much more conservative and uh, just downright uh, um, dangerous, you know. Um, so safety first, always. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, we realized or I realized playing this and, you know, in this process which was so hard uh, also because, you know, at the same time you're processing trauma even though it has happened 30 years ago and you're playing, you're performing, and my sister was with me, uh, uh, you know, with us every night, and my brother-in-law was our tour manager, so it was hell for me. <laughs> and um, uh, But I realized that there is a method to what we did. It's a five-step method, and, um, you know, in one and a half weeks I'll be in Azerbaijan, and I'm going to teach the method. <laughs> and it's applicable and it's wonderful because you can do it with with your partner it's actually an exercise in thinking free being in the moment and witnessing each other just being bearing witness of the other person nobody has to has to come from one camp to another uh, there's no war nothing to win nothing to gain it's an experiment. It's a witnessing of each other. And it takes practice. And um, uh, you can do it with your spouse, with your kid, with your parents, with your neighbor, with, the, with your opponent, you know. So, um, yeah, if you, if you want to, I have, um, I have like a manual <laughs> I could teach you or I could send it to you. Okay, does anyone else have anything to add to that? Yeah, well, I was lucky enough to be born in a secular family. So basically, I didn't have that sort of challenge with my fa friends and family. But what I can say is like, we need to give, um, as I said, the ex-Muslims, the people, the children who would like to have a different lifestyle, alternatives. It's really important. If they have alternatives, then they can actually have a better relationship with their families. According to my experience, uh, like most of the like fathers and mothers, they, they, they just like scared about the future. Like, you know, if you're gonna be an ex-Muslim, what's gonna happen to you? Yeah, and that's, that's, this, that's the main issue. If you can prove yourself, by the alternatives that is provided by the society or by the government, then I think the situation for for your parents to accept you as the way you are is much easier. Like, 
in like Europe, I think, like you know, these like you know, Muslim family who immigrated to the Europe, they can accept the ex-Muslim children, homosexual children, much easier rather than the one living still inside the country, like Iran, Saudi Arabia stuff. So I think like making alternatives and like you know, removing the taboos still playing a very key role in that matter. Thank you. Oh yeah, please do. Um, I just, sorry, I just wanted to quickly add something. Oh, no, oh, okay. <laughs> just really quickly, um, because I, I realised we kind of spoke about. Sorry, I'll be really quick. <laughs> we no, we're not about, short time yet. Don't worry. Okay, um, we spoke about obviously not being accepted back. So just really quickly, if you're in a situation, I just kind of thought of my own situation. Um, which is a bit weird, and I think it's also quite common. Um, my mother, for example, her sort of loophole to sort of accept me is that she thinks I'm possessed. Um, and so it's sort of a sorry, sad situation rather than a uh, sort of angry situation. Um, but what I would say is, you know, take a step back from the situation. You know, if your family are people that find loopholes or... <laughs> or um, are a little bit more understanding uh, or, you know, will kind of accept it. I, I would say take a step back initially um, and then you kind of just say, look, you know, this, I'm still me at the end of the day. I think even for my husband, who's Vida Vids, is also an ex-Muslim, you know, it, for him it was very much kind of saying, like, I'm still me, <laughs> Do you know, like, um, and he, his family were a little bit more understanding in that sort of situation. So it can take time so if if you know unless you have a family that completely want to cut you off then that's obviously another scenario but I would say give it some time and also in small doses so with me um I can only take my mum in small doses so the relationship will change and I think accepting that it's going to change is a really big thing because I've spoken to a lot of ex-Muslims who are like but I just want my mum to love me again the way that she did um, and that's the hardest part. You kind of have to say, this is a new relationship I have now with my family. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Okay, and does anyone else want to um, come in? Just want to add one point about uh, reuniting or rebuilding the bridges with a family. Uh, some people may disagree on this point with me, but it's extremely different for females and for males. Uh, once a woman, because a uh, woman has seen as a currency, and the value of that currency is dependent on her virginity. So once she leaves, there is a fear that she might have lost that virginity. And a woman that has lost virginity prior to marriage, then she's worth nothing. And I'm uh, very pleased in the UK that very recently uh, we stopped hemonoplasticity. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but uh, what is it? virginity repair. Yeah. And it was shocking that it was carried out in the UK. And the argument is that, well, if a woman has lost her virginity, then if we perform this, then she will be safe. But in reality, what we are doing, we're just reinforcing the beliefs that a woman's value is dependent upon her virginity. And Victoria, did you want to say something? Yeah, just quickly. So, um, yeah, Naz, I would be really interested to see your um, your methods because it sounds like medium, uh, mediation, free mediation in a way. Um, that sounds really exciting. Um, and also, um, yeah, I'd love to swap methods because um, I came up with the first uh, white paper for um, dealing with domestic violence victims in a, a safe way using body paint. I think there is a scope there to allow people to, um, through body paint, open up and be able to get to a space um, therapeutically where they may be able, when it's safe, to reach out to their family. So I would love to talk to you more and see if we could potentially combine methods. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, Milad? One last thing. I think one of the reasons, actually, like, you know, it's still tough for some of the families, like, you know, accepting the ex-Muslim children or, like, homosexual stuff like that. Uh, it's like uh, there is not enough information in like Persian language, like in Arabic language, regarding like you know, like 
how how it's gonna like you know feel like if you have a children that doesn't necessarily like follow the traditions, the Islamic tradition and stuff like that. It's true because of the like the media inside the like countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran and stuff, and like the the media's outside. I do remember like uh, we were trying to. Uh, how to have, have a campaign for Suhail Arabi, the one that won the prize yesterday, if you remember that, like an you know, atheist inside the country. Even the, like, you know, the media outside the countries, they barely say he's an atheist or he's an ex-Muslim. Despite the fact he clearly said that, I'm an atheist inside the country, the media, the, the media, the media still like, you know, stated him as a human rights activist, not an atheist, not an ex-Muslim. There was like, you know, like a propaganda against Mara, which was broadcasted by the Iranian uh, official TV channel, saying like there are these organization, evil organization of ex-Muslim, they clearly like make fun of the Islamic rules, and they clearly say like we out of the Islamic routines and stuff. This can be really affected by the families who are still very fanatic and still believe like you no, know, they should and they have this sort of responsibility by Allah to control the children and the family members. I do remember those days, like my sister called me and said, what are you guys really doing? Who is this Maryam Namazi? Who is this Muslim things? And what's really happening about that? So what I'm saying is like media is really important to make it normal for the family. Thank you. I... Okay, so I slightly disagree on something in terms of education because there is enough out there, but you cannot force somebody to learn. And there is a clear within in uh, Muslim communities a clear non-acceptance of anything but being heterosexual. Okay, I think some people in the audience are quite keen to ask questions. So let's. Oh, um, the gentleman waving his hand. Is that Jimmy? Uh, <laughs> so, I'll try and be quick, but I've got a few points. Um, so I'm going to do them really quickly. So I think one of the things that happens is when you become disowned, like if you get disowned at 23, you take this snapshot of your family, and then when you're at 33, you're still operating on this snapshot of your family from 23. So I got disowned at 23, my brother died at 33, and when I went home, I was expecting the same people from 23 to be in the house. But they weren't violent anymore. They were still, you know, set in their ways, but they were, they, there was a massive difference. So I think that's really important to, to point out is that sometimes time passes, and as we grow, they also grow and develop. But they might grow and develop towards fundamentalism, you know, <laughs> like, but, but it's just important to acknowledge that change. Um, Savina, to touch on the point that you said about therapists who are not within our community, Sometimes I think that can really work in our favor, actually, because my therapist is like a, a older white lady who's straight. And when I'm talking to her about, oh, you know, and then he said he's going to kill my mum, uh, watching her eyeballs fall out of her face, mm. oh, which yeah. wouldn't happen with, with if I was talking to a Pakistani male therapist, you'd be like, oh, yeah, your dad said he's going to kill his mum. You know, <laughs> what happened after that? Like, um, <laughs> so that shock for, you know, appropriate shock for things in our, in, in our community which we take as normal, I find so valuable because it gives me a sense check because actually my, my norms are quite distorted. The abortion scene, I just want to say, again, it made me cry. It was, it was just phenomenal. But, you know, the, again, to the uniqueness of your family is when your brother stood up, my body just tensed because I thought things were going to get violent because I know that in my family, there would have been punches thrown or slaps or something would have happened to my sister if she had declared it to the family in that way, yeah? Um, and I had one last point, which, which Seven, I'm hoping you can talk about, is when I, when I got disowned at 23, I started working 18 hour days, yeah? And now, uh, 20 years later, and being a psychotherapist, I can see that was just another form of a holicism to cope with the trauma that I was going through. When I probably hit about 27 to 35 or 33, I just disappeared into a, a, a whole lot of gay clubs and drugs and parties. And again, I can see this was me just trying to, to cope with trauma and emotions that I couldn't process. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a bit about how, you know, maybe ex-Muslims can see the signs of this, yeah? Uh, and also how they can cope with it in less maladaptive ways. 
Okay. Um, if I just answer the first point about seeing uh, uh, therapies with that, well, um, from outside the community, I totally agree with you. Sometimes it can be rather helpful. When it becomes unhelpful is when they use techniques such as write a letter to your family or uh, certain things that will endanger the individual. It cannot be done. And other things such as mediation, we don't mediate, especially if there has been any threats to the individual, and often there are. Um, and when there is honor and shame, uh, believe me, the community never forgets. Even if it's not the family directly, it can be from a member from the community who might find offense in that behavior. In terms of uh, coping, I don't think I have enough time to go through all the list, but there are maladaptive coping, and sometimes we need to go through that. It's part of the process. There are a number of people that uh, may um, cope by increasing the amount of hours they're working, uh, drugs, alcohol. Hey, it keeps the pain away. What a great way. And then there is a moment when they realize how harmful that is for the individual. But the individual themselves need to be ready to actually face the pain of the rejection and the social death because it's a social death when you come out to your community saying hey I don't believe in those strict rules and I'm no longer going to be obedient and don't forget that the community uses shunning in order for the disobedient member to not be a bad influence to the rest of the people so the ones in authority then lose control. Yeah, I said about that. Uh, you're like a cancerous cell. You don't do. Uh, you don't uh, provide for the organism, so you must be destroyed. You know, you're deviant. Okay, we'll take another question. You please. Thank you, uh, Jimmy. I'm going to take your time back from yesterday. Um, uh, thank you all for your stories and telling us the. Uh, an insight of your personal uh, life, like how it went for you. Um, uh, the film made me cry as well, Nasmia. It's, uh, it's. I don't know how to even uh, have words for it to explain it. What went through the body and all of that. Um, thank you for doing that. That was amazing. That was really lovely. And uh, respect for your mother. I know she has really big heart. Um, my mother. I don't is see my father because he died when I was 21, by the way. Sorry. Um, I see similarities in my mother as well. She is always like, oh, God will take the decisions. She's not going to say it, although she. No, yeah. Uh, Victoria, sorry for what you went through. Um, I'm here for you. Uh, if you want to talk about anything, we can talk later. I know this is hitting us all and uh, it's hitting me as well lately. But I have a very quick question and a very small comment. Uh, question is to Savin. How did you um, got it... Uh, removed or uh, how should I say it, uh, the hymenoplasty, like reconstructing the hymen, because that's still being practiced in Germany uh, to save the women, of course. Um, and uh, second, uh, the small comment is that talk to your family. They are still there. <laughs> um, talk to them from a distance, like... Uh, Ms. Me said, okay, fine, they want to be sorry about you, good, but still keep the loop, S still keep it. Sometimes, somewhere, they will find it, okay, that's a part of me, I gave birth to this thing, whatever they call you, <laughs> uh, and it's still mine. Uh, so they might retract and they might come back to you. They do sometimes, in the beginning, they are very violent, I know that from my own experience as well. Thank you. Okay, does anyone on the panel want to respond to that? 
Um, there was actually a big campaign and involved uh, a number of organizations getting together, and I can give you that information. The other thing that was also involved was uh, that, we, that we wanted to ban was virginity testing. So you go, there's a virginity test, and then you get a certificate. If we look at the UK definition of what is sexual assault, yeah, it, what happens during a virginity test meets that criteria. So I'm very glad that um, they are becoming illegal in the UK. Okay, does anyone else on the panel want to respond to the last point or should we move on? Okay, I think the, uh, the gentleman in the front row in the, has, Yeah, there's a few people who've had yeah. their hand up a while, I'm afraid. Thanks very much uh, for the lovely discussion. I had a quick question, mostly from uh, Savin, maybe. I've, I've, I get loads of messages from people that they, uh, uh, you know, from audience, that they, 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 they talk about this experience of not knowing how to respond to their families' reactions, because they, they, they're going through this process of uh, losing their faith, but uh, they, 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 they're afraid of being disowned and this... Blah, 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 you know, this, this process of excommunication. So they keep, they keep asking me that you talk about the truth, to be honest, you know, you know, as an atheist, but how are you going to, you know, teach us how to go through this? And I keep talk, thinking about this meme machine that Susan Hawke brought up and Professor Dawkins uh, uh, mentioned it in his book, that you can't really deal with its organism. It's like something like a virus, that it has its, its own, uh, it, it nests in your consciousness and you can't go, th so, something with the family that they can't really do anything about. So uh, I, I keep telling them not to tell them the truth at first and tell them probably gradually, because sometimes they can be uh, chucked out of the house. You know, they just, yes. Uh, do you think that's a good, that's good, good strategy? Or, because it's, it's still not very honest, but at the same time, if they, they, they be honest, then they will be disowned. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, the number one thing I always tell people, because sometimes people do come to the support group and they're still living with the family, and they will use the chat box because they, they are even afraid to speak. They will have their headphones. And, but the point is, uh, it's not about being truthful or not. Uh, it's about safety. Safety is always number one. And I would say take it gradually, um, because um, if you do bring that shock, it shocks their system. And then uh, uh, immediately that individual will be shunned or they will be made feel guilty because of your beliefs. Now look how you're making us feel. You're going against what we believe in. Sorry, Mitzi. Yeah, can I just add to that? Um, I advise people to start a conversation. So you're not saying like, hey, I don't believe in this like bullshit, but you're saying like, what do you think about this? Like, you know, open, I mean, I, that's what I did with a lot of family members, like, oh, this is a weird verse about hitting women. What do you think about that? And then it's just kind of starting a discussion, but then you're also assessing their response. So if you get like a, don't diss this, I will kill you, then you know, okay, I know how to deal with this situation. Um, <laughs> I was going to say something else, though. My mind's gone. Um, but definitely gradual. Oh, the other thing I was going to say was, um, I forgot to mention, prepare like a backup plan if you are going to say something. So make sure you have an income <laughs> and a job. Um, be prepared if you are going to your family and the possibility is they will kick you out. Make sure you have somewhere to go. <laughs> um, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, one final thing. We cannot be too prescriptive about this. Um, a, having a support group is very important because people can share their experiences. And everyone in those support groups are at different stages. Means that you run, they're all at different stages. So, And what a better advice than from somebody who has gone through that process themselves. Okay, the gentleman just there who's had his hand up for a while. And can we try, yeah, yes, yeah, that's right. And can we try to keep questions fairly brief since there's quite a few people wanting to speak? Uh, hello, everybody. This is someone originally from Iran. Uh, I'm 15 years now, and uh, since uh, when I was just 19 or 20, when my father realized that I became an atheist, like Samir in Lebanon, or too many ex-Muslims, he put me out. Oh, 
fortunately I had somewhere to go, but when I met him three years ago in Istanbul, because I cannot return back in Iran, I met him after eight years, and I was just 47 years old. He told me that, uh, yeah, that was not good, and now I accept you after something about 30 years. My question is about uh, to you, Mimzi Witz, please. Uh, for me, in one side, it was good to uh, be an atheist. I was proud. I, I am proud of that. It's my idea. I live with it. But other side, uh, I, wa I didn't want to uh, put pressure to my family, especially my dad. I want to ask you, because you told about the deal with that, you know. I'm not, I don't have a shame, but I have some responsibility. I had it until the time that my, my dad said, okay, now it's, it's okay, I'm angry. But for 27 years, I had a responsibility on my shoulder that Saman, you don't do the good thing for your father. What can I do, or what, you, you, what is your advice for the people like that? Thank you. <clears throat> so, just so I understand, it's more so about upsetting your family member that you're worried. So it's sort of a situation where, and I totally understand this as well, because you know, you're brought up with an expectation, um, and then you don't want to disappoint people, especially if you love them. Um, it's a tricky one. I mean, I, I, I would say, you know, it's really a personal question. I think if you're in a situation where you need to get away and live your life and you're sort of, you know, at home and stuck at home and, uh, you know, it depends on your circumstance a little bit more, I'd say. If you were living your own sort of life and you felt like, you know, I actually was speaking to someone who said, if I told my parents, that I'm pretty sure they'll just have a heart attack and like, you know, like they're actually really ill and on the verge. And, and in that circumstance, you're like, well, you're living your own life. You're in a different country. You don't need to give your dad a heart attack sort of thing. But, I mean, it's a really personal thing. I think it really depends on if you're able to have autonomy and freedom and live your life. Because if you weren't, then I would say, you know, you shouldn't really be bound to his ideal of you. Um, and I would be kind of like... You need to live your own life. And it's unfortunate because, you know, it's almost embedded in you, I think, that you want to be this, um, you know, ideal for what your father expected of you. But you don't have to be, you know? You are your own person. And also, there should be a sort of... You should be proud of who you are. And maybe there's a part of him that will understand that and you're not aware of it. So, it's yeah, it's a tricky... I don't know if I answered that, but it's a tricky, it's a tricky one. Um. I just want to add a couple of points. That responsibility comes from guilt. So you feel guilty. And then our instinct is to get rid of the uncomfortable emotional emotion of guilt by behaving in the expected way. So to be the good son and behave in how you're expected to behave. Because you got the reassurance that it's okay, so no longer feeling guilty. That's, that's the point I wanted to make, that it is very important to... Um, it can be imposed upon us, uh, the kind of children, uh, daughters, sons we are supposed to be. So it is uh, our part to redefine those roles and to, to redefine them for us. Um, and to give it back, you know, to say this is the version of the daughter you're getting because this, I think, is being a daughter. And at the same time with my mother, what I did is um, when she was in complete panic and I'm, I'm going to lose you in the afterlife and you're going to burn in hell forever, blah, blah, blah. Um, I realized it was about love and understanding, connection. So I... When I told her, you know, you want, you love people, you want to be a good person, you want to do this and that, I want to do the same. That's my only goal. So that's when we got back together again, and there was a real understanding. Yeah. 
Okay, we're coming close to the end now, so I'm going to take one more question, and I'm, can it be quite brief? And I'm afraid we have to wrap up. Could I ask the lady in the red top there? Hi, thank you very much. It's really a nice discussion. Thank you for all of us. Um, uh, now, Nasmi, thank you for this little movie, and your mother is so innocent, beautiful, lovely. And I want to ask whether your brother, because we have seen in the movie that she, he was quite furious, whether he accepted you in the way you are, because I had the same problem with my brother. He all of a sudden came into contact with me recently, and last year my father died, and he did not inform me about that. Sometimes he's okay with me, and sometimes he's really furious. And now I don't know how to handle this, because when he's furious, I cannot take it anymore, and I don't want to, uh, and I am not ready for this. Uh, you know, these typical uh, panic attacks, uh, at one hand, your family is supposed to accept you in the way you are, and uh, after some time, they just disown you. So it is happening with me. Even uh, when my father was died, I was informed after two or three days, and he uh, never informed me. And he told, uh, he sent message to my husband that, yeah, our father is no more. And that's how I just uh, got this idea that, yeah, it happened. So is it the same with your brother too and uh, the relationship, the nature of the relationship between you and your brother? So I just want you to know. Thanks. Thank you. Do you mind? Sorry, can I just ask before you do? Uh, Miriam Hello, Lucas wanted to ask the question as well. Do you mind if I uh, pass the microphone on to her and then you could answer the question? Yeah, sure. I just want to raise another point which hasn't been touched upon. When the Terror and trauma doesn't come from the family, but when it comes from the extreme religious right. Just as an example, very serious illnesses come out of the situations. For instance, in my peer group of women who were atheists and anti-fundamentalists, after 10 years of terror in Algeria, in the 90s, Absolutely everybody in my group was affected either by cancer or high blood pressure or heart problems. Yeah. Okay, and does anyone on the panel want yeah. to respond? Okay. Um, yes. I hope no cancer, but when I was 19 and I was forced to marry, I had like a almost like a psychosis something. It was, it was, a, or a Kundalini awakening, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was an awakening, but it was also like a almost death experience. And later on, I realized, um, I'm fortunate because I'm uh, apparently psychologically also very strong, but I realized later on that I hear so many youngsters, you know, they bring them to the Im Imam and they say, uh, Imam, and they say, yeah, he's possessed or he's, you know, something is wrong. And so there's a lot of psychological things going on, definitely. And maybe you can go on with that. About the brother. First of all, I'm 14 years senior to my brother. So he fucking... You know, <laughs> he has nothing on me. Um, yeah. And, you know, he grew up so spoiled, so free, and I paved the way for all of them, so that's that. Um, and I must say, I have really, really the sweetest family and the sweetest brother. He was pissed there because, um, you know, and literally he heard for the first time and he was scared and blah, blah, which I'm so happy that he just blurted it out um, because it brought me to this understanding that I didn't have yet, that even there I was not feeling uh, what I didn't feel for 30 years, you know, so it's, it's I, I'm, I'm never shunning away of confrontation because it, it shows you. For your situation, um, I really, really, really feel uh, for you. It's such a hard, such a hard uh, 
you know, way to, to navigate. But I must say one thing. Uh, you yourself are so sweet. And I really believe that the outside, it is really so within, so without. And this is going to sound weird maybe, but I don't care. This is what I believe because it's my experience. If you, um, if you work with yourself on worth, on um, allowing yourself to be, on love, on respect, um, I'm not saying it will change him, but it will change you and your stance towards him. Okay, thank you. I think that's quite a good note to end on. Um, I'd like to thank everyone on the panel. This has been a very difficult topic to discuss and obviously lots of people have had to share some very difficult experiences. So thank you both to the panel and to the, the, the people in the audience who have commented for taking part. And um, I'll pass you on to um, for the next one. Hi. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Helen. Brilliant. So much. So much to this so much more to discuss.